if you have your Bible, if you'd open it up to 2 Samuel. We left the Samuels in May. May 26th was the final uh, message preached out of 1 Samuel, and we took a, a hiatus over the summer. We had the opportunity to preach through the content of the Meaning of Marriage book study that we had um, taken many couples through and individuals through uh, in the spring, and then over the summer, uh, we had the opportunity to then uh, hear from our candidates for our elder uh, pathway as they continue their journey, uh, considering whether the Lord has called them uh, to serve as an elder, a late elder here at Erlanger Baptist, and we wrapped that up last week with the Lord's Supper, uh, reflecting on who this God is that we believe in, the one that we trust, and we celebrated our commitment to following Him as He is um, and worshiping Him. And then this week, we now begin a journey into 2 Samuel. My son um, is very grateful that uh, we finally are getting here uh, because we left with Saul dying and David still not the king. And he got really mad at me and said, Dad, seriously, would you just let the guy become the king? We have to wait how long before we're going to get there? Well, we'll still have a couple of weeks before he actually gets there and gets there fully. But we continue the journey. And so the book of the Samuels really was one book. First and Second Samuel broken up for us just because of its length. Um, the reality was that this would have been written in continuous narrative. This story, this writer that was sharing with us in the book of the Samuels. And so we have it named after Samuel because it starts with his story. But the reality is he is the transition figure. Right? Leaving a time of judges to a time of kings. The reality was that in ushering in these kings, the nation of Israel was actually rebelling against the Lord. If you remember back, they looked around at all of the nations around them and said, hey, we want to be like them, whereas from the very beginning, God has called a people to be like him and not like the world. They said, we want a king like everybody else who will lead us into battle, who will fight our victories. Samuel is rejected, but he, God says, Samuel, they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, and they have chosen this day to have a king, and so give them what they desire, and they got someone who was tall, dark, and handsome, except he just had one significant issue, and that was a moral flaw. He was a man. He was not perfect in all of his ways, in all of his dealings, and from the very get-go, we see him hiding, scared to death to assume the position, and then once he gets in the position, blowing it rather quickly and being told that he is going to lose his royal family lineage as kings to another. We are then introduced to one whose name is David, a ruddy little guy that here comes onto the scene killing a Goliath and ushering in a transition. But the vast majority of the book is then like Saul trying to stop the transition and going back and forth, dealing with issues, but then when he's done with dealing with an issue, going back to hunting down Saul or down David, trying to kill him, while Jonathan, his son, is giving him David the inside scoop, making sure that David stays safe, and ultimately finding and encouraging him in the wilderness, even as it gets really tough. David finally fleeing to the Philistines, trying to prove himself there, losing his own kind of mind in his own way. It was a mess. And we get to the end of the book, David kind of gets a restoration by God, and he shows, uh, the Lord shows that he has favor with David, and then ultimately Saul ends up in a destruction. He faces the Philistines. If you remember, he goes and finds someone to conjure up Samuel. 
And he says, hey, I got problems. And Samuel says, you got bigger problems. Tomorrow you will be with me here. And indeed, that's exactly how the book ends. The Philistines go out to battle against the Israelites. And Saul and his son die in battle. Unbeknownst to David, until this point in 2 Samuel, as we open the book to read. Would you stand as we read the first chapter? Now it came about after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David remained two days in Ziklag. On the third day, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And it came about when he came to David that he fell on the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, from where have you come? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, how did things go? Please tell me. And he said, the people have fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know? that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. The young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and behold, Saul was leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen pursued him closely. When he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me, and I said, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, please stand beside me and kill me, for agony has seized me because my life still lingers in me. And so I stood beside him and I killed him because I knew that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown which was on his head and the bracelet which was on his arm and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them and so also did all the men who were with him. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the people of the Lord in the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien and a Malachite. Then David said to him, How is it that you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? David called one of the young men and said, Go, cut him down. And so he struck him and he died. And David said to him, your blood is on your head. For your mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Then David chanted with this lament over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the sons of Judah the song of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jessar. Your beauty, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How have the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. If you look back at chapter, that's exactly what they were doing. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exalt. O mountains of Gilboa, let not dew or rain be on you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and pleasant in their life, and in their death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How have the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Jonathan is slain. On your high places, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of women. How have the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? Father, would you speak to us through your word? I pray that you would give us space to feel this moment with David and his men and the people that were scattered those looking to you. Lord, this morning I recognize that we in this room have a lot of different weeks that we've lived over the past week. And Lord, we all are accustomed at some level to the adversity and the struggle, some with more recent loss than others. 
And so I pray that this morning would be in a, um, a word for us to speak to our hearts and to our minds, that we would rightly respond to you and to the things that we face. Or would we be called back to you? In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get to David and how he kind of takes the news, I want to start with this messenger who has just arrived. The first thing I want you to see is this. Sly attempts to gain favor often backfire. We have this one who shows up. A weary traveler has come to see David with news and with evidence. But he's also come with a story. For anyone who remembers the account, fresh off the reading of 1 Samuel 31, you'll notice that there's some inconsistencies in the reports given. In 1 Samuel 31, you have Saul being hit with an arrow. He has suffered a fatal kind of blow, and yet his life lingers in him, and so he calls to his armor bearer and says, would you put an end to this? The armor bearer says, mm. and so Saul falls on his own sword, and then once the armor bearer sees that Saul has died, he takes his own life and dies, and it's a very sad moment. In here, the story is recounted a little different. The narrator of the Samuels kind of tips us off, not only to how we are to receive this news, but how we are to receive the one who brings it. You see, the solution is to look at this Amalekite and go, okay, he's lying somehow. And the question of why. The information that he brings is accurate, it matches much of the details of 1 Samuel. The, Philippian, or the Philistines had won. Israel had lost many. Saul and his sons were dead. He only leaves out the rippling effects. If you remember when the, the towns around the battlefield had seen the Philistines win the victory, they had fled from their towns. But David seems to sniff out something. He gives the reporter a chance to further verify the information. And from here, we see it kind of unravel. He says in verse 6, By chance, I was happened to be there. And this is what has gone on. And lo, I was called upon to execute the Lord's anointed, and I have proof here in front of me. There are lots of questions around the story. Why was he there? Why was he present, just happened to be in the middle of a battle as an Amalekite? It was the Philistines and the Israelites. Why is this guy there? What is he doing? Second question, why in the world was Saul so isolated? I think that's an interesting question. Why was Saul, he was just hanging out, he was all by himself, like there, he's no mention of the armor bearer that would have been present with him, probably some of his closest guards that would have been tending to him. And lo, Saul is by himself, and here is this guy who happens to be on the mountain there to be responsive to Saul. It says in his story that the Philistines were in close pursuit of Saul, and yet that Saul was leaning on his spear, not really going anywhere because he was in so much pain. Like, there's a lot of just kind of hmms about this as you kind of listen to this man's story. And the question is, what was he trying to do? He's creating a story, maybe to explain why he's collected the king's crown and bracelet. Was there an allegiance that this man had, maybe to David or to Israel? The question seems odd. Did he see David um, in the potential new position? And so he would receive the, the news maybe positively because the king is dead and now David can reign? Maybe he was seeking reward. After mourning the news, David presses him again. Where are you from? And he answers, he's an Amalekite. That's probably not a good place to have just been from. If you go back, right, when he is working with the Philistines and he's gone to the, the front lines to kind of be one of the Philistines and help fight against the Israelites, David is rejected by the Philistine leaders and he returns home only to find out that Amalekite raiders had come 
and taken all of his possessions and his wife and all of his wives and all of these things. And so they had gone after them. They had found this worn out, sick Egyptian guy and fed him back to, you know, strength so he could explain as to where these Amalekites were. They went, they found them, they killed them all except for 400 dudes that fled on camels. And then he took all the spoils and, and it says that they lost nothing and brought it home. They were in this moment sitting in Ziklag celebrating. They had just given gifts and sent gifts to uh, the different cities in Israel that David had um, relationships with from the spoils. Over and over again in 1 Samuel, when given the chance, David had never struck the Lord's anointed. There was a respect that defied everybody else's understanding, but there was a deference given in life, and we'll see in death as well in just a second. There is a sacred respect for the office, regardless of that person. With the myriads of reasons and multitudes of possible, of possible moments, David could have that justice, that justice and judgment on Saul himself. And yet, time and time again, he had withheld his hand. And whether this Amalekite realized it or not, David responds to this Amalekite as if he had done exactly what he had said. It's the only account that David receives in the scriptures. And so he doesn't know about the story's differences, nuances. And so he takes this one's word to heart and judges his intents as if he had killed Saul. If the story isn't true, why did the Amalekite share it in such a nature? I think the most natural answer is to gain favor and possibly reward. And yet we see it meet him with his own demise because God sniffs him out in his deception. The Amalekite had told the story that he thought would put him in a position to receive reward from the future king, potentially. But because of the tenderness of, of David's heart, the messenger found his own end. We're confronting with the rolling biblical theme. The God who sees ultimately exposes all things. The God who sees ultimately exposes all things. Over and over again, we see in the scriptures a God who allows people to be found out or who exposes them or allows them to face the consequences of their actions. It happens from the very beginning with Abraham and Sarah to Ananias and Sapphira. This book opens with one who is found out twisting truth for gain. Soon in this book, we will find several more doing the same thing, including David himself with a woman named Bathsheba. Twisting truth for gain and hiding sin. And yet one thing we see is true in 2 Samuel as it was in 1 Samuel, and that is that God is the consistent one through these books. He is the one who is true and right and faithful. He never falls short when all these others do. The heart of all would be exposed. You look at the New Testament, it's populated with many verses about this. Jesus comes as the light to bring light on man's sin. Nothing in secret that won't be shouted from the rooftops. It is hard to jockey yourself in each situation when you're trying to be received in different ways, trying to get reward. If you've ever been there, if you've ever been in a moment where you're talking to someone and you're trying to get an angle of favor, and so you, you think you're safe and you say something, and that was not who that person really was, and you realize that just backfired and blew up in your face, there are moments where if you're trying to pretend to, to be someone, to put yourself out there, that you can get yourself in hot water really fast. This Amalekite is a really good example of that, thinking that he comes bearing good news, thinking that he can show himself as being this gracious and kind one who kills the king, finds himself at odds with the very one who has sought, even though having his life sought by death, 
to preserve the one who sought him. We try a lot of times to position ourselves well. It's a very fleshly thing to do, very natural thing for us to do, to be seen as good by everybody. And so you may know someone who's kind of that chameleon, who acts one way before one group, but then goes into another group and acts a totally different way because they're trying to appease them. Let me tell you, I taught high school. It's amazing when you take a kid and put them in one group of friends, let them interact, and then you pull them over here and you put them in this other group and see what happens. Everybody's trying to figure out who they are, talking all different kinds of ways because they're trying to impress everyone around them to find favor. And at the end of the day, there is something much deeper. God looks at the heart. And he exposes. For the Christian, I'm very grateful that he does it for a good reason. Because he's conforming us into the image of someone else, his son. And so here's the question for you. Are you the same person all the time? Are you consistent or are you trying to play the odds of each person that you're dealing with? There is wisdom in knowing how to talk to people, but there is sin in trying to deceive them that you're two different people. Okay, now let's turn to David. Until this moment, David has not learned of Saul and Jonathan's deaths. And in this chapter, David's going to become an example for grief for us. And I want to say this, it is right for us to grieve well. It is right for us to grieve well. David has been enjoying the spoils. In 1 Samuel 30, he has led his men to defeat the raiding groups from the Amalekites. He has conquered all those guys except for the ones that got away. He's brought everything back. He is celebrating and he is confronted with this moment. It's here that we find David at the beginning of 2 Samuel along with his men enjoying it for a couple days until someone comes to town. Someone whose clothes are torn and dust is on their head. The traveler probably navigated about 80 miles to get to David and his men with this news. David knew that Israel had gone to war against the Philistines, right? Because he had actually been willing to go with the Philistines against Israel which the Lord graciously got him out of. And now this wearied one has come to share the results of the battle and Israel's defeat and Saul and Jonathan's death. And look what it says in the scripture. It says, upon hearing Saul and Jonathan's death, he instantly and genuinely responds. In verse 11, after hearing of his death, David takes hold of his clothes and tears them and so did all the men who were with him. They mourn and they fast until evening for Saul, Jonathan, and the people of Israel. Notice that David's response to the news is set before any further inquiry and response to the messenger. The messenger gets set aside for a moment because the narrator of the book, whether this is in chronological order or not, the narrator of the book puts the lament before. He puts the the emotion before the next step. They are elevating its importance and its prominence. In this, there's an invitation here for us to mourn well too. God's leaders and their people have been disgraced. They had lost in battle to a longtime foe. The king and his son were among the dead. Now, we can talk about all the character flaws with Saul that you want to, but the reality was, and I reminded you last time when we were finishing the book, Saul had reigned for 42 years as the king. Yes, he had his downfalls, but in the midst of those 42 years, he had protected the people. He had gone out to war. He had battled the Philistines. He had protected the land. From age 30 to age 72, that's what he had been faithfully doing. And here he was again at age 72 on the battlefield fighting. There's something to be said for that. The king had died. But it was not something to boast in. It was something to take pause and to find space to grieve. 
We see David here honor Saul and Jonathan through a lament. He's setting an example in the narrative, right? The right understanding of how to, under, to, to look at this moment. And he gives them the right example, the right response for the people of God to what has just happened. He gives them both things. He, as the leader, gives them the the story, the understanding of how to address this moment while at the same time modeling how to grieve. One commentator writes this, the condition of the people of God disturbed them. The same principle should control our life in the kingdom. Do we not have the obligation to mourn over the church? Sometimes it is not difficult for us to observe, analyze, and critique The apathy over faithful doctrine or the flirtations with uh, paganism, the infatuation with the political correct moral society and agenda. But these things should drive us to mourning and grief, to prayer and to sorrow. And so the question for us is what kind of example are we setting when it comes to righteous grief and emotion? Do we too quickly move on from difficult or devastating news? I feel like many of the anxieties that are born by us, and especially our younger generations, are expressions of the built-up mantles of grief and anguish from all the events that they're seeing around themselves and the world that we simply don't take any time to rightly emotionally process and respond to. David and the Samuels narrator gives us an example and the space to do it better. What are some events that we're glossing over too quickly and too quickly discounting instead of allowing ourselves to grieve? Maybe it's the loss of a loved one or a friend. Maybe it's a societal injustice or struggle or strife. Maybe it's a sin or a failure or an adversity in the church or within this local body of believers right here. Maybe it's persecution or gospel oppression internationally among brothers and sisters in Christ. When you hear or experience bad news and loss, do you take space and time to respond well? Can I highlight and offer David's model to us this morning? It's called the lament. Verses 17 and 18. Verse 17, my Bible says, then David chanted with this lament. The actual Hebrew says he lamented this lament. It's kind of exaggerated. Like, this was a big deal. He lamented this lament over Saul and Jonathan. And look what it says in verse 18. And he told them to teach the sons of Judah the song of the bow. He gives them words and a model for them to grieve. Commentator I read said this, when painful things happen, grief remains. Sorrow is not merely a sad event, but a continuing process. Grief grief not only interrupts, it abides. And because it abides, there must be some mechanism, some procedure by which God's people can express that grief. David provides that vehicle for his people in the form of a lament. This lament, definition of a lament, would be a formal expression of grief or distress, one that can be written, read, learned, practiced, and repeated. This is a lament. A lament is different from the informal, spontaneous, immediate outbursts like they have in verse 11 and verse 12 where they tear their clothes, they mourn and weep. A lament is no less sorrowful, though, or sincere. It is a vehicle for the mind as well as the emotions. Is it an expression of thoughtful grief? It's not the vomiting of emotion, but the crafting of chosen words to express that emotion. It is not an uncontrollable release, but a structured sorrow. Words carefully selected, crafted, honed to express loss. Too often we in the church express an impatience with grief, expecting people to get over their emotions too quickly. I would offer that there must be a balance between being 
in complete despair and hopelessness, and the hurried glossing over of real pain just by giving divine promises and perspective. There has to be a balance between those two. We can't just go off the handle and be desperate and despair. But we also can't just say those emotions aren't real. We're not going to actually feel them because we have God's promises and we should get over ourselves fast. Scripture gives us a vehicle for that middle ground. It is the lament. Here we have an example. Verse 19 The the situation is given to us. How beautiful, O Israel, is slain on your high places or your beauty. How the mighty have fallen. And then he goes into the the shame, recognizing what has happened is now going to affect not only the people of God, but the God of the people. That this thing is horrific, not just because we've lost people, but our God has been shamed. And so he, he writes, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't, don't let the Philistines gloat, even though that's exactly, because he knows that's exactly what they're doing. But his words here are reminding them of the pain that comes with the shame in this moment. God has been, in one sense, seemingly defeated. And the invitation of the world is to mock. The grief over God's profaned name stings. And we understand this to be a result of the sin even of Saul. Can I ask an aside question there? Are we broken over the sin of the church? Are we broken for the reproach that has brought his name? Or do we look when other churches struggle or when church denominations split and almost smugly lift ourselves above them as better? Or are we broken because God's people are demonstrating a brokenness? It's really easy to come up with a quick meme that mocks. It's a whole other thing to be broken and lament. Verses 22 through 26, he gives a, a centerpiece and a place of homage to Saul and his son. It's very interesting. I don't know how many people would write the way that he does in this moment. There's been a guy that's been chasing me for like the last couple decades trying to kill me, and I'm going to write a glowing obituary about him. And yet, he doesn't see Saul in light of his flaws. He chooses to see Saul in light of the things that he has done and as a reflection of Jonathan in his father. He sees them as united, one who is faithful to his dad even while faithful to his friend. He calls the women who used to sing the songs of the victories now to weep over the king who's fallen. And I think it's interesting that he then reserves the words to be taught to the people of Israel in his own mouth how beautiful Jonathan's friendship was. We have a message here given to us, and then at the end, the content is repeated. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. This is the moment that David and his men find out that Saul is dead, and Jonathan has died. And I want you to see that they sit in it. They lament. The pain is real. The brokenness is felt. And that's how the chapter ends. It doesn't, it doesn't end turning the corner to hope, to the future of David being the king. It ends sitting in pain, lamenting, broken over the things that have happened to the people of God and to the God of those people. I don't know how long I sit. I confessed to Eric, for whatever reason, I haven't lost someone close to me. I have 
all six of my parents, all five of my kids, my wife. There is a very real sense in which I need to learn from a David here. Have there been heartaches in my life? Yeah. Have there been things that have gut punched me that I wasn't expecting at all? Yeah. But as I look out across this body, I see the faces of those who have lost people that they loved dearly, that they had spent decades at their side. I see people who are going through marriage challenges, who have faced marital separations and divorces. I see people who have lost kids, who can't have kids. I see people who are struggling with all kinds of realities. And the question is, what do we do with all of that? Do we just say, I'm fine, I'm fine, and keep moving on? I think we have a model here given to us, which is very gracious, from the one who sought after God's own heart, that it's okay to sit at the feet of God and to lament the brokenness and pain of this world. It stings. Hurt stings. The glorious news is, even as David knew, because the next chapter starts with, and so David inquired of the Lord. Faith remained in the midst of all the pain. And that is the invitation for every one of us. Because you see, we have a God who can relate. He has seen a people reject him. He has pursued them over and over again, only to have them reject continuously. He has offered his son to them, and they have killed him. And he bore that, not just that moment, but taking the sin of all of those people who have rejected him and putting him on him and paying all of the punishment and the wrath. There is a God who can identify with every one of us in a lament. But there's a God who then offers hope and victory because that same one who was crucified rose from the dead. And it reminds us in the midst of a lament that it will not always be so. That though pain is real, it is temporary because there is something eternal and forevermore lasting. That there is pain when we lose that which we wanted to satisfy us, and yet there is one who will ultimately satisfy us with his presence, and we will be perfectly content with him. This is the gift that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pain is real. But there is a God who has conquered it all and invites us to cling to him. We have Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified, buried, and risen again. Would you pray with me? Father, what a, what a chapter to begin. But one that can hit very deeply in all of us. For any who have traveled this journey of life very long, we know pain. And to various degrees, we have all experienced the disappointments, the losses, the heartaches. We have seen, even in our own lives, where we have brought aim upon your name, we have seen moments where we have brought reproach upon your people, where we have disgraced the very gospel that we proclaim. We have seen things out of our control. We have seen things in our control. And I thank you for an example today of a lament where David invites his people into the sorrow to grieve well. I pray that we would not be too light and too quick 
that we would not be too flippant with those who have lost and those who are struggling to push them past, but to invite them into healing by addressing and going through the process well. And ultimately, Father, I am very grateful that we are not left with simply, oh, how the mighty have fallen and without hope because we know the end of the story as well. Though the mightiest one ever seemed to have fallen, he rose from the grave and he is preparing a place for us that where he goes, we will go also. That there will be a place where there is no more tears, no more hurt, no more pain, no presence of sin, no discomfort, no dissatisfaction, nothing left wanting but fully satisfied by the presence of the one who made us and made us a relationship, who teaches us even through lament that this world is not our home and that this world can never satisfy our deepest needs. Father, we come to you today thankful for Jesus. Thank you that the book doesn't end or the chapter doesn't end. We have hope to look beyond. Father, help us even this morning to respond well as we take space to lament. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.